somehow feel very important standing at the controls of the biggest spaceship in Hollywood, the $3 million Battlestar Galactica set. This is not only a spaceship, but it is also the biggest hit of the television season. And with me is one of its stars. This guy is truly a matinee idol. He's co-hosted my show, and I know that the feminine hearts are going to beat right now, as I say to you. Here is Richard Hatch. <laughs> I can't get over I know what you're more thrilled about than anything is the catch you made on, <laughs> the other night on Superstars, which they haven't seen as yet. Richard, I know that you're thrilled. I know you've worked very hard, and it must be a comforting feeling to know that you're on a hit show and something's going to be around a while. Yeah, I think that's something that every actor wants to get. You need that one hit to put you in a position to do all the things you've ever wanted to do. And I think that this show has enough special people and people caring about the show to really have a quality production and I think that that's something I can be proud of. I see a lot of enthusiasm in your face <laughs> and I, so I know that you're very, very happy about this. I am so impressed that everything here is in working order and it must take a lot of doing to keep it that we way. We have over a million dollars worth of computers here and we have somebody that constantly is here making sure that each and every one of these is in top condition. Can all of them work? Mike, you're going to have to excuse me. Oh, you have to My go. favorite soap opera's on right now. Do you mind? Excuse oh. me. Oh, oh favorite soap now. opera? I mean, I'm supposed to interview the guy. What do I do, stay here and watch it with him? I guess I might as well. Oh, you're kidding me. Uh, Mike, <laughs> we're getting some kind of foreign message here. Do you think you can decode it that? It says, uh, welcome, Mike Douglas, to the bridge of the Battlestar Galactica. Isn't that nice? That's wonderful. <laughs> That's terrific. Okay. I appreciate that. I want to talk to you about uh, the kind of schedule you now have. Does it give you any time for your lady friends, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> he was so nice to welcome me. Hello, James. <laughs> no, um, you don't have very much time when you're starting out a series. You are so busy learning lines. There are so many demands being made on you for publicity. They're sending you here. They're sending you there. And I think that our hours are, we sometimes film from 6 in the morning all the way through the night because we do a lot of night work. We want to get, uh, we have to lay in the special effects and you cannot do that during the day. So we end up sometimes filming 18, 19, 20 hours a day and it gets to be a long, long time. Do you have any time off? Um, we have been filming just about a year now. We started out a normal season, takes six months, but we have been filming for almost a year. And that is because this production has more money and more time and more people being put into it than any other previous production. Now, is it true that this is also seen abroad, this show? Uh, they have, I have been told that this is going to be a feature length film. It's been a feature, yes. They opened in Canada, and from what I hear, they outgrow Star Wars in the first three weeks. Mm. So, that speaks for itself. That's really thrilling, and yeah. what, what that's going to do for your career it must be a joy to think about, huh? I, what's important to me is that this, this vehicle gives me a chance to grow as an actor and helps put me in a, in, in a position to do the things that I've always dreamed about doing. I think we all have our dreams, and we all have things that we've always wanted what to do. What are some of those dreams, Richard? I want, to, I want to work on some special projects about people, situations that, that I really care about, working with people that I believe in their integrity, and people that, that don't just care about making money, but people who care about really making something special, where everybody from the crew on down is so involved in the process, of, the process that's going on out there that you never have to say quiet to anybody on the set because everybody is so involved in what's going on. You're into it. Yeah, and that's what I'd like to be involved with. That's where magic comes from, and I want to be part of a magic process. Now, while you're talking to me, I can't help but, uh, before I brought you out, I can't help but notice there are a couple of rooms. Uh, what's that room up there for? Oh, that one up there. That's the uh, space can. <laughs> <laughs> that's the space can. Yeah, that's the space yeah. can. <laughs> okay, can you come up here and show me the main control? Sure, sure, sure come on. Please. Well, I get a chance to actually press some buttons and things like that. Well, if you're a good boy, Mike, I'm going to let you take off for us, okay? Oh, really? Yes, I am. As a matter of fact, oh, here. I, what are the, oh, yeah. Our honorary space bulb. That's for you. Oh, terrific. Yeah, you got to hold that, okay? In fact, you got to put that in your mouth. See? Hold it just okay. like that. Okay, now sit down in the seat here. This is the way that we know all the circuits are on because the bulb will light up. Excuse me. Am I, am I dressed right? I am I dressed properly? Oh, hold it. That's right. Got to have the official space jacket. Oh, boy. Jeez, I hope my, my little friends are watching me. <laughs> See Uncle Micah. There you go. Getting the jacket. Oh, oh no, I feel like that. Uh, uh, what about that? Hey. Hey. No, that's another show. I don't want to. Howard's the right network. All right. 
this is a very complicated procedure now. Okay, do I have to? Very intense. I don't have to belt in or anything. Uh, no. Um, our spaceship is uh, is outfitted with special seat belts that when you take off, they will clamp around you and hold you very secure. Oh, okay. Good. Now, what you're going to do is you got to push. This is the steering stick. Okay. Gotcha. Now don't. Oh, careful. careful. See this red button? That's yeah. the takeoff button. Oh, the first thing you have to do is put us in position to take off, and that's these two buttons right there. Well, are you going with me? Uh, no, uh, I uh, I have to go to the space camp. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> so what do I press? Uh, Will this be a long flight? <laughs> because I, you just made me think of something. I have to go to the space camp, too. Okay. Okay. Push with the right hand. You push these two buttons here. Okay. Okay. With the left hand. You push this button here. Simultaneously. Simultaneously. Or together at the same time. Together at the same time. <laughs> oh. Then with your head down here, you're gonna push this little red button right there. With my head. With your head. Okay. See, most of our our engineers have three arms, but in this case. Oh, I see. Okay. You tell me when. All right. Let me get in position here. Hold it. Hold it. I have to get it all ready. This red button or this button? This red button. <laughs> We always have to rush our teeth because we never know who we're going to meet out there, see? <laughs> oh. Okay. You carry that with you at all times? At all times. That's my official space brush. <laughs> <laughs> things, okay. things must be really good in space, I'll tell you, when you're worrying about how good your teeth are. I mean, I just hope I have mine at the end of this flight. All right, so ready? This and the red button. At the okay. same. Are you ready? I'm ready when you are, CB. One, two, three. Go. Uh, Press that button with my nose. Oh, we'll be right back right after this, I think. <laughs> I'm hearing the set of Battle Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> with the man who plays Apollo, the daring young hero on that show, Richard Hatch. Uh, Richard, on this show, you do a lot of scenes uh, with children and animals. Mm -hmm. And that would frighten most actors, because there's an old saying, watch out for children and animals, because they're scene stealers. Right. Not always by choice, it just happens. I think that may be true, but for me, when I work with children or animals, it brings out what's special in me. It makes me better. So I really enjoy playing with, with children, especially Noah. Every time I look into his eyes, he just kind of, there's such a glow in his eyes and such a truth and an honesty that he just, he brings out the best in me. And I, I look forward to every single scene I have with him. He's a great little guy. Yeah, yeah. He's wonderful. He's a very special little guy. At that age, he's so... Uncle Mike. Oh, he did? Isn't that nice? Did he give you a hug? Yeah. He is so warm and so loving. And so bright. Yeah. yeah. That's a little intimidating too, isn't it? I speaks fluent French, Richard. Well, I'm all for that. You know, I'm I'm a great supporter of. Are you bilingual? I learned a little French and Spanish in school, but I've never really uh, progressed to the point where I could speak it fluently. No. You play Lauren Green's son on the show, and I'm curious about uh, when you were a kid. You were a kid when that show was popular. Did you watch that? Did you watch Bonanza? <laughs> never missed an episode. I mean, walking in to meet Lauren Green. Hey, I don't care what anybody says, and, and, and it's the reason why they say a lot of people in show business have trouble having relationships with people outside the business. If you've seen somebody on a television set or a movie screen, which is, you know, yay Larger big, than life. Or you cannot, it takes a long time to get beyond that image. It's like indelibly imprinted on your mind, and before you can really see the person for who they really are, it takes a lot of time being spent with that person. And it took me about... Ooh, six months to really start to penetrate through to the feel of ease. Yeah, to, to penetrate through that yep. Cartwright image to see Lauren Green for who he is. And boy, when you start to see him, I don't think most people know he is such a warm, charming. Oh, he's a fine. He man. can tell stories and keep you laughing for days on end. Did I mean, you, you ever tell him? Did you ever tell him about that? I'm curious about how you felt. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a warmth between us. I feel a definite warmth. Did he make it easy for you to break through that yeah. that veneer? Because he came up the very first day we were working. He. Uh, he came up, introduced himself, and we talked a few minutes, and I, you know, I didn't know what to say to him. I, you know, we want to say all these things, but you're sure he's heard them a thousand times. But after I walked away, the producer came up to me and said, you know something? Lauren's very happy with his family. And when he said that, it moved me because I said, oh, great. He, he cares that we're going to have a family, that this is a bunch of people who care about each other. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Because I can tell you with having done the show that I've done now for 16 and a half years. <clears throat> 
those people are like family to me, and I get my vibes from them. Right. And I'm sure you feel... And they pick you up on days when you're off? That's right. It's the people around you, the crew. If they're in your corner, uh, that has a lot to do with whether or not a show succeeds. Not only that, it has 100% to do with what I call those magic moments on screen that affect people so deeply. When everybody is like tuned into the same thing, I bring out the magic in you, and you bring out the magic in me. Right. And pretty soon there's magic, and you don't need gigantic names in order to create magic. It's true. So... Uh, you know, we've talked before, the last time uh, you co-hosted the show, you were doing a show called Streets of San Francisco. Right. And I had the feeling that that wasn't too pleasurable <laughs> an experience for you, that, that, that they didn't make it that easy for you. Well, and this is, and I see a different Richard Hatch, and that's why I'm asking you that question that way. <laughs> yeah, I, th sometimes, you know, the hardest things for us sometimes are the situations where we grow the most. Uh, that situation was very, very difficult for me. Not because people made it difficult for me, but because it was innate in the situation. It was the kind of situation where you step in and replace somebody, and no matter what you say, when somebody comes on a football team or a new person on the team, sure. you tend to kind of wait to have that person prove themselves. And it requires a lot of trust and patience to, to work your way through that and work your way into that inner circle to become part of the family. And th there was such tension, such pressures going into that show that it took me a long time to kind of deal with those pressures and deal with that tension so that my what I had that was special in me could come out. And uh, Carl Malden was somebody who I have immense respect for. He's somebody who demands the best from you. And I had my little insecurities. And sometimes I didn't trust myself. Sometimes I overcompensated for not trusting myself. I was doing what? I was afraid at one point that because at the beginning I was given not as much to do uh, at the beginning, I thought that the audience was not going to get to know my character and that the transition from Michael to myself was going to be very difficult. So I and my publicity person felt that if we could do a number of stories where they would get to know me and get to understand who I am as a person, that that would help bridge the gap and help them to get to know me and make that transition from Michael to, to Richard Hatch and help them to accept me. And uh, uh, in the process of that, I realized that, you know, what, what is really important is putting 100% of your time into your work because that's going to speak for itself. I realized that even when I was on screen for one minute, if I was 100% there and had done my homework that night, that what was special about Richard Hatch would come out and the audience would feel that. Sure. But I didn't have to be on that screen 20 minutes or a half hour. Proven by the point that in, in a picture called The Hustler, Jackie Gleason was on the screen for nine minutes and was nominated for an Oscar. Right there. I mean, he gave and it was there and... It, and they caught it. The audience caught it. So it comes down to trust. I want to get back to, to the other side of Richard Hatch. Richard Hatch, the athlete, the jock. I and mean, that's what Richard Hatch really wants. <laughs> now let's face it. That's what you want to talk about. That's what you want to do. Oh, boy. That's that's the part of you that they don't know that much. You know, you went on Circus of the Stars last right. year. What did you do? I flew on a trapeze. Had you ever done that before? No. And I don't know how I did it. I, I came out there and I was not on a show at the time. And uh, they said, well, would you like to be on the show? I said, sure. And I came out there and they said, okay, we have tried, try a few things and see what you like. So I tried jumping off of this, you know, thing into an airbag. And I went over here and I climbed the rope and did another little trick. And I looked up at the trapeze and he mentioned that as another one. And I said, okay, I'll think about which one I like. And the next day they called me and they said, well, Richard, uh, if you want to be in the show, <laughs> you have to fly on a trapeze. Fly? Now, you, David, who was the catcher? Uh, David Nelson was the catcher. So uh, I, well, I was in the position that if I wanted to be in the show, I would have to fly. And the trapeze has always intrigued me. You know, I was a gymnast in school. I was a pole vaulter. Anything that had to do with flying turned me on. No. Only I was always afraid of heights. And uh, You were a pole vaulter and a gymnast and afraid yeah. of heights? That was such a quick thing. You know, you go up and you're down before you know it, but to be up there, standing up there, and looking, looking down, down looking very down frightening. Is, yeah. That's what's a turn off to me if I don't have to look down. And especially yeah. when you're not and when you're falling, there's not hardly another place to look but down. <laughs> that's, that's right. And the thing that intrigues me about what you did, what you did was that in rehearsing, you had, it all has to be timed. And finally, when you let go of the trapeze and you turn around, yeah. that guy's hands have to be there, right? Did you ever, in practicing, turn around with nothing there? The first couple of times, I would throw myself too far out, and we would have head-on collisions. And we would smack each other, and the only thing that he could do to protect himself was to put his fist out there, his hands out there, and push me away, because otherwise, he was knocked 
off the, the trapeze a couple of times. Oh, right wow. Way. So I had a couple of bad falls that way, but I always had lines on me at that time. It was when they took the safety lines off. Oh, safety lines, so you didn't have to fall all the way to the net. At least the they net. could hold them, because I'm, you see, that I... That net jerk, you're inside the... Oh, line. the net, people think a net. Oh, oh I'm talking net. about the safety lines. Oh, the, the safety lines don't bother Do you. they keep them taut? Yeah, those keep, those keep those pretty tight so that you never really get that kind of a jerk. It's the net. The net is not soft. Oh, I if know. If you don't hit that net right, you are in trouble. Did you ever hit it? I hit the net really bad a couple of times. I did not have the expertise in that event to really do what I did. And you know, if you hit that net and don't grab onto that net, you'll be an Oxnard, too. You bounce up and let it right. come down in your head. I mean, if you don't know, really. <laughs> why, why does Oxnard get a laugh? <laughs> a Bakersfield would have gotten nothing on that, but Oxnard got a laugh. I don't know. It's you know, you juggled when you are on my show last, and we have three leaded tennis balls, I think. Can you still do that? Yeah, I why, How do you keep in such good shape? Uh, going to the space can over no, here. No, come here. No. Now tell the truth. You I, uh, tell me you're into... You I do some yoga, some tai chi. I have some worked. or a lot? Well, I, it depends on how much time I have. I've worked out a series of exercises for myself over the years, which I know my body and I know what my body needs. And I... Uh, I wish I knew my body. <laughs> Somewhere inside here, there's a gorgeous body. Show me what you okay. can do. Can you still... You have to stand for this? Oh. I've never been able to do this, and I'm intrigued by people who can't. You know, they've said through the years, Richard, that jugglers don't have a full deck. Did you hear, have you ever heard that? What? <laughs> that anyone who juggles what? does not have a full deck, does not quite have a full deck. That's incredible. This is over. This is under. Oh, oh, look at this. That takes such dexterity to do that. Can you do it with more than three? Can you do it with more than three? I just started working with four, but I do not have that down yet. Yeah, I can tell by the fact that you just dropped one. No. <laughs> no. Thank you, Richard, very much. It's always a pleasure to, to visit Thank with you. you. And I'm, congratulations on being a part of what is the biggest hit of the season. Thank you very much. Pleasure to see you. We'll be right back. Television's show of the season, Battlestar Galactica, and with me is the show's resident rake, Lieutenant Starbuck himself, yeah. Dirk Benedict. And Dirk, you look awful. Why? I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there goes my image. I say, you just right got out of a shower. I know. I just got <laughs> me working on the set. We're helping the grip set up for the next show. What well, are I'm playing? I'm what do they do to you? I mean, they. Well, they're trying to change my image, I guess. I don't know. They're trying to bring me down to earth, so they got dirt in my hair and. Dragging me, putting me through my paces. But tell no, me. we're doing a show where I, where I'm, uh, you know, in in dire straits. So this is it. So I dashed from there to here, and uh, yeah, we appreciate that. How do you like it? How do you like what's happened to your career and, and your life? <laughs> now, which shall I answer first? <laughs> I love what's happening to my career. I, it's great. It's been, it's been, uh, been most uh, interesting experience. I'm going through the growing pains of going from the unemployment lines to the. Uh, but uh, 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 personally, you know, it consumes your life to the point where I have no personal life left. That's not what I hear. No. Uh, uh, certainly not sure. what I hear. Well, or no, really? Dirk. No. Really? Well, you must be. Listen, fine. I haven't <laughs> seen you for a while, and and I've aged. Look how he, I've aged. Look how he changed the subject. No, I was going to say, I've aged, haven't I? Yeah, well, see, that's, that's, see, that's you have a little bit. Yeah, this, this, see, this, bring the candle at both ends, you see. No, you, do, you, do you work as long as I hear you work? I mean, sometimes a lot of night shooting yeah, and yeah. starting early in the morning, going through the night. I always go through the night, but now they're paying me for it. Help me make it Help through, me the make through the night. Are you at all like your, your character on this show? No, actually, I'm a very serious individual. I don't go out and mess around. And uh, <laughs> No, but... No, in truth, there's a lot of similarities uh, between myself and Starbuck, which is one of the, which is why I was so excited to do the part, you know. Uh, <laughs> amazing what you can read into one word, isn't it, folks? What a well pause, yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, the pause that embarrasses. You know, there's this interesting story because it has to do with my show and our offices in Philadelphia. Yeah. You were doing your show, my yeah. show in Philadelphia, when you heard about this show. Listen. I mean, it is true that it all began on your show. No, no, I'm not fishing no. for that kind no, of thing. No, I know you're but not. that is a coincidence you know. that you were doing my show and you got this call. Right. Uh, from I got the a manager. I said, 
I think my manager was actually in, at your at your at your uh, at your and you were in office. Montana, that's I was it. in Montana that's where it. I usually am. I was it. fishing and what was he doing, doing in my office? He was trying to sell you me. <laughs> <laughs> he was saying, "Listen, it'd be great if you just put." And I so I got a got a phone call and uh, and I couldn't do your show then. I had to come and do this. Yeah. It was you the know. second time we wanted you on a show. That that was it. And he that called. Was, yeah, I had been on once before, and you you were going to give me a second chance. To make good. Well, aren't you happy? <laughs> aren't you happy that you didn't run back to Philadelphia? That you came here instead. Yeah, I, it's true. I'd rather be here than Philadelphia. Yeah. Oh. 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 <laughs> See that came from I did. Dirk Benedict. <laughs> yeah. My and friends in Philadelphia did not come from me. Yeah. What was your first impression uh, of this whole thing when you heard about it? This well, show. Uh, my first. Well, I'm not a science fiction buff. See, I've never been uh, enthralled with the whole area of, uh, of, uh, of the scientific mind and what it can do for mankind. But I was fa the, my first introduction to it was the character of Starbuck. You know, somebody, the, the producer, Gunn Larson, spoke to me about this character. And uh, I met him right in some gambling den somewhere, and he said, you know, you're perfect for it. <laughs> so that, and that, I was very interested in that, you know, to get to play a character which is upbeat and positive and has a lot of fun. And uh, and so I was very excited. Uh, I had no idea what I was walking into. I was sitting on a million and a half dollar set here, you know. I know. I didn't know. I, was I thought that a million and a half was coming to me. I was told. I showed up. Look what I get. Old Manny Jesus. I was told three million dollars set. Were you? You just gave him a cut. Yeah. Great job there. Yeah. I know well, the writers on this show have created a language that I'm intrigued with, and maybe you can help me about what are some of the words that you use for common ordinary things that, that we describe. Like well, what would I well. Call? What would I call uh, a script? What's a script? A script? <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> no. I don't understand. Without a script, nothing else. No, why don't we have a list of them here? I mean, most of them. I know, I mean, I know a lot of them from, because they're every they're a common occurrence in my language now, like frack or oh frack. What does that mean? Frack? Yeah. Well, actually, it's a bad one to start with because frack can be used. You can Frack is an expletive that can be used in various situations. Oh. So. Oh. Oh, that frack. Oh, that frack. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. thought it was half a frickin' frack. No, the old <laughs> act. Oh, no. I don't know. We didn't bring no, frack back. Okay. No. And then uh, Felger carb, as in cut through the Felger carb. Now, cut through the Felger carb. Now, how did you get the producer to allow Starbuck to smoke cigars? Well, uh, see, I did a screen test for this part. And in the screen test, I, ins I was so, I was, you know, I'm an actor who loves props. And so I, and, and a cigar has been a part of my life since I was working on ranches in Montana. And uh, so I said, well, I need something familiar around all this Felker carb, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I got myself a cigar to hang on to. I don't want to get any of this on me before I leave. <laughs> <No. laughs> now, when you oh, get a cigar, right. how do you light up? Huh? Well, you there's various ways. Um, where's it going? Red eye. Yeah? Great. Oh, we brought two. We, we got, I got this guy real well trained here. He's the uh, one we captured and uh, hung on to. That was a Starbucks cigar. You can smoke it with the wrapper on it. Does it need a little help at the end? Mind? No, he's very... What? So do you just bite the tip off? Or you, I, uh, I do. Do you? Yeah. I've always wanted to do that. I like that. All right. And then... Hey! Oh, hold on, yeah. There, thank you. Now, uh, wait. Well, nice. It's a tin can. It's an overgrown tin can. We I'll say it's overgrown. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, you ready to light up? Yes. All right. Red eye, do you mind? Thanks. Thank you very much. I don't like the way you stand. I mean, he's just... <laughs> it's like the front end of... Hey. Don't, don't, I've got a whole line of cigars coming up. Whatever you do, don't. This tastes like Felger garb. <laughs> <laughs> Dirk Benedict. Battle Star Galactica. And we're coming right back as soon as Dirk tells us all about his ladies. Oh. That's a deal. <laughs> ABC hit series Battlestar Galactica, and we have been joined by Lorette Spang, who plays the lovely Cassiopeia. Isn't that wonderful? Cassiopeia, that's fun to say. <laughs> and Herb Jefferson Jr., who portrays uh, fire pilot Lieutenant Boomer. That sounds important, Lieutenant Boomer. That's what's in the name. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get chosen for this role? Um, it was very short. The length of time there, I mean, it was... Within 24 hours, 
I got a call from my agent. I was already set to do uh, a uh, first you cry project uh, with uh, Mary Tyler Moore. Oh yes, about the mastectomy. Yeah, we did a segment on that yeah. last week, yeah. and um, it was set to start two days later. When my agent called and said, uh, we must go over and meet on this uh, Battlestar Galactica, but in order to meet for the show, you have to give up your job on uh, First You Cry, which meant to meet for the show. Uh, I didn't have the job, but in order, in order to go in to meet for the show, I had to be available in order to meet. Have you ever been in a situation like that before? Uh, no. That's not an easy thing to make a decision on, is it? Not at all. It was all happening just like that. Who helped you make the decision? Did the agent say, I think you should really do it? I made a decision that night. I sent a script over at the house that night, and I said, well, it's worth the shot. It's really worth uh, trying to uh, see what happens. And the next morning at 9 o'clock, I went over to ABC and met with uh, producer executives and casting people and, uh, and three other actors who were being considered for the same role told that I was chosen, got sent from ABC in Century City over to Universal, fitted in a space suit, boots and everything, all of that was thrown on was right over to the sound stage and went to work, so I was back there. Uh, what if it had turned out the other way? If they had said no after having given up that, that job or just a, you know, actually an interview? It would have been worth it anyway. I mean, the yeah. business is full of uh, decisions that have to be made on the spur of the moment and you just... It's a gamble I had to take. And it was wonderful of it to turn up this way. And Lorette, you were only supposed to do the pilot. Right, yeah. I was just going to do... Um, it started out to be three and a half weeks. I think everybody was three and a half weeks. Wasn't that what you were told? Something like that? What, the contractual? Uh, yeah. And it turned out to be two and a half months. You know, it was really... And I was out in Colorado doing a pilot called Colorado CI for Quinn Martin. And um, I got a call and an offer to do Galactica, which I thought, what is Galactica? <laughs> had no Sounded idea. Important, though, didn't it sounded it? strange. And they started talking about Cassiopeia and Starbuck. And um, so I flew in. I flew back to Colorado on the weekends and did that. And flew back here during the week and did Galactica. And um, did you, after you did Galactica, the pilot, did you have a feeling that that was going to happen? You must have had some kind oh, of a feeling. No, I... I didn't know anything about, you know, I had no idea. I mean, we started to get an inkling after a few weeks that, uh, gee, this is big. This is kind of this is sort of fancy and elaborate. <laughs> Chances are um, this yeah, is ready to go. Yeah, I mean, you know, either that or it's just going to, you know, which it didn't. And um, it was just, it was amazing. Your role uh, of Cassiopeia created quite a few R, didn't it? Yeah. A lot of controversy. It's what was the fuss about? Well, um... My part, my uh, job, my designation was socialator, which is what the press has been saying is a prostitute. Now, I... <laughs> well, I you <laughs> no, I thought of it more at her as a geisha girl, sort of a, you know, because she's not a hard character at all. She's a very loving, um, fun-loving character. Speaking of, you, this costume was so funny because Lorette was sitting here trying to straighten herself out and there's really not much to work with there. Who's yeah, I was trying to put a strand here. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I, I was doing that the first couple of weeks, you know, on the set. We were going through that. Now, you've played socialators in, uh, I like that word, so I'll stay with it, <laughs> in many of the other roles you've done. And I, I understand it created a, a little family problem, too. Did you have a, an uncle? Everyone has yeah. one of those uncles. Yes. Boy, Uncle George is a funny one. You know. <laughs> Mine's Uncle Frank. Uncle, uncle Frank. Frank? Yeah. I did, a, um, and it wasn't from this show. It was from a love boat that I did. And I was, um, I was not a socialator. I was just... Uh, a loose girl, shall we say. Yeah. And Deborah Lee Scott and I went on, on the boat and we were trying to meet guys and Bob Seagrin came along and hey baby, you know. <laughs> and um, the I... The gentleman, Bob yeah, Seagrin. Yeah. Oh, he's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, we we ended up, when we finished that, I got a call on my answering service from my Uncle Frank and Aunt Mary saying, call immediately. They live in Indianapolis. Oh, they're in Illinois now. And my Uncle Frank says, you're ruining the good family name. What are you doing? He says, you keep playing these parts. He didn't like it at all. Well, he was joking. He had a lot of explaining to me with the neighbors. <laughs> so he's terrific about it, though. Herma, I know that you get a lot of special respect here on the set because of your, your theater background in New York. Well, it's helped. It's, um, 
we've been working under a, but then a lot of us have a lot of theater background as well, Richard, Dirk, Loret, you know, a number of us. But um, I think it's helped us all a great deal uh, in terms of the pressure we've been working under because uh, a lot of this style, uh, working with all this is very new to a lot of us. And um, it helps to have a, a foundation and background in theater that's very highly disciplined and whatnot to give you to allow you to work with all the problems and yet still do your your job and I, I, know, well. I know being a singer that i love to get a hold of a song that i can quote get my teeth into uh, do you feel the same way about the uh, the kind of material you have to deal with yeah you know it's uh, we all like to go from one plateau to the next sure. and sure. see something go on the way we'd like uh, I'd like to see the show go on very well. I'd like to, to see Lieutenant Boomer doing this, that, and the other thing, and working with different people in different situations as well. Yeah. It's different in the uh, in film than it is in theater because it's all happening so quick. It's something I really had to adjust to when I first got out here. But uh, definitely very, very, very positive. There's nothing quite like getting on a stage and starting here and going there. You mean in rehearsals? No, I'm talking about doing the whole show from start to finish. Kind of like the old days of when football players used to play for 60 minutes, you know. But, uh, you're really in the arena. I mean, you're really there. You can't yeah. turn around. You can't say cut. You can't let's say cut. cut. You can't go back. You get the one shot and that's it. You learn how to cover yourself. Uh, I think uh, that builds uh, a lot of character in a yeah. person, sort of thing. That's what I meant by foundation. In the Definitely. There's nothing like it. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Lorette Spying and Herb Jefferson Jr. very much for letting us uh, visit with you here on the set. It's not uh, easy to walk away from your work and sit down and talk like this, but you've made it very comfortable for me, and I hope I have for you. Battlestar Galactica is what they are a part of, and we'll be here all day. <laughs> Top-rated uh, television show Battlestar Galactica with the man responsible for all the costumes. He has won design awards, including an Emmy nomination. I'd like you to meet costume designer Jean-Pierre Doliac. Jean, this is interesting. Now, Mrs. Douglas is here on the set today, and she knew nothing about the fact that I was going to interview you. But the first thing she said to me was, find out who the, who the designer is. These costumes are spectacular. Oh, thanks an awful lot. She's got a for that yes. sort of thing. <laughs> How did you become involved with Galactica? Well... Um, I was called here to Universal to do Galactica because 10 years ago in France, uh, I did uh, some of the costumes for Jane Fonda and uh, Barbarella. Oh, of course. And so yes. it sort of has uh, followed me along as a science fiction designer, although my background and training was in history of costumes and not the science fiction elements, so it sort of just happened. Happy coincidence, yes. though, isn't it? Yes, wonderful, nice thing. Who else have you designed for? Because the women in this audience, I know, would like to know uh, the answer to that. I designed for an awful lot of really nice actresses and actors, uh, Patricia Neal and Eleanor Parker in The Bastard and Olivia Hussey, and I designed a film with Henry Fonda and Eileen Brennan that was released a couple years ago, and I've designed uh, for June Lockhart ever since I came to the United States. She was one of the first people I met, and I do all of her wardrobe now. So I've been very fortunate because I've had a lot of very good people to work with. Uh, Sean, I've heard and I've been told that this, uh, well, we all know about the budget of this show, I think the highest budget in the history right. of television, and certainly the, des the design budget must be the highest in the history of television. It has been so stated. I would, would it compare with the design budget on a, on a feature-length motion, motion picture for theater? Yes, probably even more so, because uh, in the first three hours of Galactica, I was given a budget that was in excess of a quarter of a million dollars, and then we've done ten hours. Is that, is that unusual? Oh, that's highly unusual for television, but this show is unlike most anything that's ever been on television, the fact that everything on the show is made. I mean, every, everything, including the belt buckles and the insignias and everything. We don't buy anything. Now, had you not heard that the budget was a quarter of a million dollars, as you just pointed out, would you have had to tell them that this is going to be extremely expensive, or... Um, Universal has been wonderful to work for. I have had the best cooperation, and nobody has ever said a word to me at one time about the money spent for the show. So I really have no idea how much was spent. They Touching by that, you, you, have been, you have been told by other people you work for that <laughs> we're getting a little out of hand with this budget. That's marvelous not to, to hear something like that. Well, let's take a look at some of the, the costumes, and first let's talk about the jacket that I'm wearing. Oh. 
or uh, almost wearing. This jacket uh, was designed for, for Tiny the, Tim. <laughs> it was designed for the uh, Viper fighter pilots, and they wear it especially when they're in their uh, fighter craft. And, and they uh, have kind of a jumpsuit under this. They, they? No, they have a tunic top and a pair of, of uh, very form-fitting pants that all is one color, and so as a result of it, it does look like a, a jumpsuit. Uh, now, you didn't, uh, judging by some of the costumes I've seen, I don't mean this as a disparaging remark, but they are very per uh, perfect for what the show is. Right. But they don't look comfortable. Uh, that is true, especially in the You don't worry about costume. those things, do you, John? Uh, in Just let them suffer. <laughs> <laughs> this all looks good. <laughs> in a space show like this, you really sort of can't deal with that because you're, uh, you're fighting for something that is so unusual looking. You have to, well, I sit and talk to the actors and say, look, you're going to be wearing something that is not going to be comfortable, but I want you to know it beforehand. Yeah. And most of them are very cooperative, very cooperative. Just so you say most of them. Who are the ones who are not? Well, <laughs> <laughs> let's look at some of the drawings. This, this is uh, the outfit that uh, the commander wears. Right, this, this is Lauren, Lauren, Green's, Lauren costume. Green's costume. This is made out of a uh, uh, dark blue chamois cloth that looks like, uh, looks like velvet. Huh? Yeah, it looks like velvet an awful lot on television. And uh, all the uh, ribbon uh, on the uh, jacket and on the cape are actually made out of silver uh, filament that goes into the weaving of the ribbon and it's uh, uh, bordered on both sides by a black and silver checkerboard design. Now, did you initially just sit down and draw this, or did you draw now, many been, before you came, came up on this one? We had about uh, four to five different prototypes before we actually came mm -hmm. up with a, a concept that everybody was in agreement okay. with. Okay, who wears this, this next costume? This uh, uh, furry-looking thing is worn by some clones that are on this planet that they visit, and it's an ice planet, and so they're very cold, and this was made out of uh, five different animal furs. Are these very, very expensive? Uh, let's go back to Lawrence. How, how expensive is an outfit like that? Uh, it's really hard to say, Mike, because of the fact that, uh, like I said, I never see the figures on how oh, to make. I see. But I can give you uh, some kind of an idea of the fact that there are 40 hours of labor put into every single one of the costumes on Galactica. I have a team wow. of approximately 20 seamstresses and 15 tailors headed by two very good uh, cutter fitters and a, a head tailor who does all of my time. It's not easy yeah. to find people who do things no. by hand anymore, is it? No, not at all. It's uh, it's a lost art almost. Most things are machine made today. Yeah. What is this? this well, I think I know what this is. This was made for the three android sisters in the first three hours of the July. android sisters? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they had uh, two, uh, four eyes and, uh, and two mouths. And uh, this costume was all done in mail and weighed about 75 pounds and it was uh, done in sort of what ladies we ladies wear something that was 75 pounds well not in reality and I'll tell you a very funny story about this we went through pantyhose on this dress every single time they put it on because being out of chain mail and all separate strips here and and the movement would just completely eat away the pantyhose after one shot <laughs> that'll make some people some manufacturers happy out there you know this was a dress that was uh, uh, done for Marin Jensen in the casino sequence of Galactica. It's uh, three tiers of Alex jersey that we hand dyed, and this dress was tripled, and so it was quite a, a chore. What, what do you mean by that, tripled? We had to make it up three different times because she had action in the film, and we didn't want her, and she, she had a double that had to wear, and she had something happen to her where she was scurried and fell down, and so we had to protect ourselves that if something happened to the original, we had two other standbys. How much would a dress like that cost? This one runs approximately, I would say, about $1,200, just for the dress alone, that's not for the boots. Oh, the boots are separate, yeah. huh? <laughs> You wouldn't throw in the boots for $2,500, what are you going to do? This was done for Jane Seymour. The, she announced her wedding in this, and this was done in uh, uh, two different shades of uh, French uh, silk that was all cut on the bias in various panels. And then the cape -lit jacket that she's wearing was all hand embroidered. This was a very expensive dress, and well, we only made no. none of it. The fact that you emphasize very expensive, John, what are we... Well, there was, are this we was in the all neighborhood or a vicinity now? <laughs> You're, this, you couldn't really retail this dress. It would have to be really like uh, a designer dress to sell it because it, it just was too much uh, handwork. Could, could you wear that. something like this? Uh, me personally? Uh, no, 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 I don't look good in red. <laughs> no, John, I mean, could a woman wear something like this today and not be 
laughed at? Or no. Did she go to a party and something um, like that? And that, not have people say, yeah, that's uh, far out or something. You know, we've had a lot of uh, people interested in uh, reproducing the Galactica look for ready-to-wear look. About so um, we're uh, talking with various people right now, so apparently there is an interest in looking like this in public. I have to go to a cocktail party tonight, and I see a costume that would be right just here. great. Right here, right here, yes. Right here. I don't know, though. This was made for the villain in the show. John Calicos is wearing this. And I'd I like to like wear that because I don't drink and I, I'm not too interested in your cocktail party. Yeah, <laughs> that, that would make me interesting. I'd stand out. Not for long, but I'd stand out. That's nice. The concept behind this was he was uh, the man who took over the uh, Cylons and uh, the Imperial race, and they were headed originally by sort of reptilian creatures, and we wanted to carry it through with a sort wild. of a very evil, snaky green. That is, that is really wild. Now, oh boy, this is a good look. These costumes were done for a segment uh, called The Magnificent Warrior, and this was a costume that we made up about 25 of, and they were just worn for extras. The, the, this wasn't worn this by... This looks like a European who, peasant. Uh, the, they were um, uh, wheat farmers in the script uh, of sorts, and uh, we wanted to kind of bring a, across that look. It does I, have a futuristic quality to it, though. Somebody told me it looked like Patton, so thanks for the compliment, oh. because you thought it looked like... Uh, European uh, peasant. Okay, we're going to have to pause for these messages and we're coming right back with Jean-Pierre Jean -Pierre Doliac. Of course, this guy hasn't heard about Nair. <laughs> <laughs> What is this, this is who we affectionately refer to as Piggy. He's really known as the Bores and the Magnificent Warriors. And uh, as fierce looking as they are, they were uh, uh, non-meat-eating people, so they were vegetarians. But uh, we wanted them to really look awful. And uh, he was made in various uh, skins and, uh, and wolf hide and everything else. There was a lot involved in his costume. A little fungus condition going, <laughs> but other than that, he's okay. Now we have one here that really looks interesting. This is sort of an influence upon my Barbarella costuming, uh, although uh, I didn't really want to bring forth that kind of a look, but this is a segment we're doing called The Young Warriors, and they come down on this planet where there are these people, these five children who are sort of a Viking-type race. Uh, her cape here was very interesting. We, uh, What's that made of, that cape? We made a, a fabric up that looks like the suction cups on an octopus's tentacles, and it t took us a week and a half just to do this cape. What did you do with? Foam rubber? Uh, it's made with a various, it was backed by chiffon and then it was made with uh, uh, things that you pack uh, dishes with, this little... Uh, oh, they love things. Yeah, yeah, kids love to yeah, stuff right, on right, yeah, oh, like, And they come in various uh, different things and, and we did this and then we laminated it with various coats of paint and it's still very light. So you and, improvise a yeah, lot. Yeah, an awful lot. Work, don't you? We try... Uh, not to really just go out to spend a lot of money. We try, these are the brothers and sisters in the same the same segment. Person. Right, and like I said, we, we're not trying to really spend money. We're trying to get an individualistic look. I are all of you? them made out of expensive fabrics or no. how about the accessories? This was, uh, for example, one of the belts that we used. I it's found like makeup sponges. They are. Um, these were ma uh, found in a store that he had had these in stock for 15 years and never sold them. You and I looked know. at them and I went, this would make up a great belt, and uh, that's what we've used it for. That's wild. This, I'm sure a lot of people will recognize, is a loofah back scrub. And we took them, and we shaped them, and the women on one of the planet wear them as head guards. And it gives a very interesting look. <laughs> you don't know what you can do with your bathroom sponge. <laughs> what is uh, This is the uh, helmet that everybody loves so very much. This is what the fighter pilots wear in the series. Um, I cannot take full credit for a lot of this, these things. These helmets and uh, the Cylon costumes were designed in conjunction with John Dykstra, who does the special effects it's on the show. Very Egyptian look to it. Right? Um, in the script, they uh, discussed the fact that they came from a mother planet that uh, probably went on to then discover Earth. And so we took the oh, concept... You, excuse me, you just turned... Yes, the, we turned the light off. I don't off. think it can be seen in this light, but that light's back down there. Can you see yes. it? Yes. This was put in because we were trying to uh, uh, make up a, sort of like an invisible screen. Uh -huh. So we did it with light. And then, and then after that, we found out that it really helped in the actual filming because the, uh, the cockpits were so dark that it was good for the light on their face. Now, of all the lovely drawings we've looked at, really the Cylons, uh, the bad guys in the show, have the most elaborate costumes. And I'm I somehow feel very important standing at the controls.